Welcome to the Schizoid Angst, whatever this is. And uh, as usual, welcome to my channel. To anybody that's new, I'm sorry you stumbled across this, but it's okay, you'll get through it. Uh, in any case, uh, today we will be speaking with a, and I wanna, let me, let me try to pronounce this right, because I'm terrible usually at this. Uh, Dr. Daniel Winaric. Winaric. Winaric, I got close. You did. I got close, because I bet most people say what, Winrick? Winneric. Winneric. Okay. Win yeah. Winneric. I'm just Dr. W. Whatever. Yeah. I'm gonna, no. I'm gonna mess this up. Uh, in any case, uh, and uh, we're gonna be speaking with this individual, and I got Burb here next to me. Uh, yeah. We're gonna cover all sorts of subjects, uh, from just uh, general schizoid stuff to really nitty gritty information about uh, therapy and uh, diagnosis and a variety of factors, variety of things. Uh, I'm not going to bore you explaining what it is exactly we're going to talk about. In any case, uh, the first most important thing would be for uh, the, doc the, the good doctor to introduce themselves in any way that they wish. I, um, thank you. I am um, Dr. Winarek, but um, I guess you can call me Daniel, but who you is is unclear well um, you call me daniel i mean you're saying i can call you that i'll call you daniel please yeah, yeah no i, I all prefer right. that. All um right. yeah uh and i'm a i have a phd in clinical psychology um from adelphi university um which is in garden city uh long island um and i have a license to practice psychology so um i'm licensed by new york state i'm in private practice where i do psychotherapy and testing for learning disabilities and ADHD. Um, my research interests are in schizoid personality disorder, which makes me somewhat rare among clinical psychologists. Um, and humans. And humans, yeah. Uh, um, I got interested in the topic because, um, well, it was pretty, I, I don't want to say anything about anyone else, but let's just say my dissertation advisor was not unfamiliar with the plight of the schizoid on a personal level and uh oh he, okay cool um should have them on too <laughs> <laughs> yeah that would be something um but anyway he was he's a great researcher and a really prolific guy who's published a lot and is a smart researcher and he's like look there's this area in psychology schizoid personality disorder that literally no one is doing anything on and no one is researching or publishing on. So you can be this schizoid guy if you want it to be. So I started, um, you know, having to come up with like a dissertation project. I started researching schizoid personality disorder when I was doing my externship in a psychiatric emergency room. Um, the benefit of that while waiting for people to come in um, in crisis is you can, uh, you have access to this really great library system at Columbia. So I found articles going back to, you know, the eighties on schizoid personality disorder that I otherwise would not have had access to and was struck by just a, a letter to the editor in the American Journal of Psychiatry um, by someone named John Livesley to someone who's a little more famous, Theodore Milan. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but he's this guy Herb? who's nope. Milan. Milan's personality theory, he kind of... We're uh, terrible with names, so... Yeah, yeah. Possible. I mean, he, he has, you know, uh, he's just got a cool theory of personality um, okay. that includes, a, a you know, a serious, um, in-depth, you know, look at schizoid um, dynamics and stuff, which is unusual. Um, but so there is an argument between him and someone else about the distinction between schizoid and avoidant personality disorders, both being marked by you know, uh, high introversion, social isolation, social Ooh. withdrawal. Um, and uh, the DSM defines avoidant personality disorder as involving social withdrawal due to fear of rejection, embarrassment, humiliation, you know, whereas schizoid PD, at least after DSM-3, was defined as social isolation due to a lack of desire for social relationships. And so that differential diagnosis was pretty controversial in the mid eighties um, because it used to be one category that included both, you know, fears of rejection and, um, you know, a preference to be alone. Well, they um, did one thing right. And that was separating them. Uh -huh. That was absolutely the right move. I'm sure Burr would agree. Yeah. 
definitely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway. Uh, any, well, uh, yeah. No, no. So my dissertation looked at whether it was the right move and how to, you know, answer that question because, um, right, it's not theoretically, it's not necessarily just a, a matter of opinion. Um, mm -hmm. Like there is an empirical answer theoretically, uh, or at least that was my goal to sort of frame it as a question that could be answered. Um, so, right, I had to like figure out a way to measure this idea of avoidant personality as defined by the DSM and this idea of schizoid personality as defined by the DSM and then compare them on how much they desire social relationships or not. And I found basically evidence that they are distinct disorders, like you said, um, but they do overlap in some ways that's not appreciated by the DSM. So it's certainly a, a kind of a, you know, like an easy way out of answering yeah. the question. Don't pull back punches. You, I you took speak. It. A, you speak. That, that was my conclusion was All that, right. you know, they're different, uh, but I, you know, people with schizoid personality disorder, the variables that I looked at are kind of interesting. So I looked at rejection, sensitivity, um, social anhedonia, which I think your audience probably knows what anhedonia means. Yeah, um, we don't just know what it is, we live it. Yeah. Right, so there's, you know, uh, people think there's like social anhedonia and physical anhedonia, um, but I just looked at social anhedonia because I don't think, you know, getting pleasure from physical activity is necessarily that much of a marker of anything. Like well, schizoid. We, can, we can stop right there for a second. Um, I have seen some research that um, in schizophrenia spectrum, there's uh, a reduced sensitivity in terms of physical touch, pain sensitivity, eyesight, smell um, along those lines. And a lot of schizoids in the community do report that they um, don't have a lot of physical sensations, be it sexually or enjoyment of food or stuff like that. That's kind of a recurring theme. And that's also true for me. I'm not, I don't know about angst, but it's certainly true for me that um, certain sensations are very doled. Um, like uh, yeah. I, I, sure. I mean, you know, yeah, yeah, plenty, plenty of stuff is pretty dull, especially when the anhedonia really gets kicks off for sure. Yeah, so I don't know if it makes that much sense to separate them into social and physical anhedonia. I think it's you know anhedonia. Mm -hmm. it's just yeah, a, I agree. You know, yeah, it, it makes no sense to separate it for any. And you know, just the way that the test scales were constructed, um, the social anhedonia scale was like made specifically to measure. Um, schizoid withdrawal as defined by the DSM versus avoidant withdrawal. Um, so it was relevant to the question I was asking. Um, and there's a limit to the number of scales you can put in and, you know, physical anhedonia just sounded less cool than social anhedonia as something to study. Less um, cool. <laughs> less interesting, you know, less yeah, yeah. solving of, you know, like cutting dynamics that really speak to some, you know, intense emotional experience that maybe it's not as intense when it comes to inanimate or physical experiences. So um, <clears throat> I think if to understand what uh, schizoid PD is, it's helpful to figure out like what it isn't, right? So you're looking at avoidant. Mm -hmm. um, so le like, let's sort of dig into avoidant for a second to figure yes. out like yes. what, it, what it really is composed yeah. of, right? Um, so in the DSM, um, there's the, it's the fear of reject, rejection, right? It's the fear of shame, right? And so, well, let's dig into that. So um, if you're going through the world and there's a, there's a setting in your mind that's applied to potential situations and past situations where you don't feel like you could ever be a competent in a situation, right? But you also care about the people that you're interacting with, right? So there's this internalized incompetence and this externalized in-grouping of like, people are good, people are kind, um, but I'm going to fail in the situation, right? And that will actually do damage to them, right? So my presence, and then that, that can sort of manifest in a lot of different ways. Like it can manifest physically, like, I, my body is so unattractive or so disgusting. My body is so incompetent at the job of appealing to other people's sensibilities that for me to be in their presence, it would just harm them, right? And then, well, it makes sense to not be in their presence because you well, don't- well, want I, to I think, I think those are two different things, um, whether or not uh, 
you don't want to be around people because you're, you're worried that you're going to harm them or hurt them or something, or if you're worried that they're going to harm or hurt you. I mean, in well, some yeah, way, exactly, yeah, exactly. yeah. Coin, you know, for sure. Um, but, you know, I think there, you know, theoretically, there's an argument that the dynamic of being afraid that you're going to hurt uh, someone else by your presence. Um, you know, I would say that theoretically, that's more sort of classically schizoid than avoidant. Okay, well, well, let's, yeah, that, that's actually interesting. So let's, let's keep, let's keep exploring. Yeah, interesting. Right? Yeah. Interesting. So, um, the, so what is shame in a sense, right? Well, shame is the feeling that you have transgressed a, against what society views as the good, right? Like there was something that you were supposed to do and you didn't do it, or there's something that you're not supposed to do that you did do, right? That's sort of, that's sort of shame. So it's like, if I, if, I, if I, you know, accidentally hurt somebody that I care about, you might feel a flash of guilt. And then if that becomes pathologized over time and grows and grows, you might call it this intense shame. Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah, and so, well, that's why I'm, that's why I'm sort of talking about this in terms of avoidant, because shame seems to be so, mm-hmm. as part of the, the, the construct of avoidant. And then if, totally. you, if you go back to the example of, um, well, my body is not what it could be. Well, my, my proficiency in this domain is not what it could be, right? My math skills are not what it could be. Like any domain that I enter, I'm not what I could be, right? And that feels shameful, right? And I would inconvenience others with my presence, right? And, it's, and that and then abstracts across all of these domains. And it has to do with shame, right? It has to do with this internalized incompetence and then this sort of externalized in-grouping, right? Where, well, you know, if other people are out-grouped, if other people, you don't care about them and they don't care about you, you don't really care if you inconvenience them, right? So that's why I think that this is avoidant, right? This fear. Now, in schizoid, you could have the same dynamic. And that's the interesting part, right? You could have a schizoid person who had a comorbid uh, problem with shame problem with you could have a schizoid and an avoidant comorbid but they're they're not mutually exclusive you could have one or both or either does that does that make sense it does um and i think when you have both you know it almost you know doesn't matter that much whether you talk about it as one common syndrome or two comorbid conditions because they're both present regardless of yeah. conceptualize in, it. in your person and your unique personality framework right yeah um, but I do think you're right. I mean, avoidant personality disorder is a disorder of shame in a lot of ways. I, um, just a little bit of an anecdote, but it's interesting to me. Um, so there's a, uh, a user that often goes on my streams and uh, I'm not going to say who they are, which, you know, whatever, <clears throat> but, but they uh, publicly talk about it uh, once in a while, but they're, they're constantly dealing with uh, in their country that uh, they keep, or they initially were diagnosed avoidant. Right. And they were actually dealing with the issue of attempting to get across to their um, their, uh, I guess, uh, therapist that they are not. Mm. Right. And they had to explain this to them over and over and they needed the words for it. But at the same time, they had a lot of anhedonia. So they were just like they just didn't care. They so they're never going to listen. They don't never they don't listen. They don't care. Uh, Why talk all this sort of stuff. Uh, and, um, but the issue was that is that they diagnosed them as avoidant when in fact, all the reasons for their social distancing or their, their social isolation and everything else had nothing to do with, uh, a, uh, a sense of, um, feeling incompetent around them specifically. It was more like she, well, they were not interested in the activities or the association to these people. And they could not relate to them in any capacity. And so any kind of interactions were energy draining, exhausting, and oftentimes feel, felt alienating. Right? And uh, that's why they avoided people uh-huh. uh, the vast majority of the time. And that's what they were trying or attempting to get across to their uh, therapist. But nonetheless, um, they, they stuck to the avoidant and then eventually uh, moved, uh, I think moved it to like avoided mixed diagnosis or something like that. Uh-huh. And um, they're currently still working. Uh, and I think they're making some headway uh, working on trying to get a proper diagnosis for what their situation is uh-huh. uh, because they, 
they they look at uh, the, the uh, description for avoidant and the reasons for the isolation and the shame and the reasons for the shame and the reasons for so many things and none of it matches up. Uh, but everything uh, in the differential diagnosis of schizoid uh, does in fact match up significantly. So this is a struggle that often happens. Misdiagnosis in general happens a lot for uh, people that have schizoid, schizoid PD. Well, because nobody really understands it, you know, and there's yeah, yeah. a little interest that it's so, like, yeah, yeah. So everything from being avoidant to being um, autistic yeah. to being uh, a lot of things. I've, I've come across many of people that in their youth, uh, I was one of them, uh, they were diagnosed something like ADHD or autism. And then later in life, uh, did they get a rediagnosis of schizoid PD? Um, so well, let's let's leap off of the example that you just gave. Um, absolutely. Where you had a you had a person who was misdiagnosed as avoidant. Um, and what was really going on was they were seeing other people and seeing that they had vastly different interests and values, mm -hmm. right? Or, or the, perceiving this is not necessarily true, but that's what they perceived, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so then, well, that's actually a kind of externalized incompetence in the sense of there's things that I care about that I want to do that other people are not able to or willing to engage in with me, right? This is very different from a, from an internalization of incompetence. It's like an externalization, um, and so that's sort of what I wanted to do off of this um, talk about avoidant PD is to like run a permutation, it's like to expand our working memory, right, and to to do some more of these to see well what schizoid isn't right. So again, schizoid also isn't what I like to call like. Um, Ex, ex, incompetent object syndrome or useless object syndrome, where a person has been conditioned by experiences to automatically perceive other people as both unwilling and unable to help in the sense that, well, they, they don't care about me. And even if they did care about me, they wouldn't be any good at helping me, right? And a lot of the time in the schizoid literature, you get this brought up, it's like this radical self-sufficiency and mm -hmm. this distrust and this about yeah. safety and that's brought up. But the point is that that's not schizoid either, right? <laughs> that's that's also so that's something else and that's a whole other category of person right um but that that could be schizoid or not you know right it could be schizoid or not right I exactly right, right exactly um so you know if schizoid isn't avoidant and it's not this useless object syndrome right and then well there's other in the schizoid literature there's lots of talk about grandiosity because they've encountered schizoid individuals In conflation who, with narcissism who, right, who have like who have narcissistic traits right uh and so uh uh well i mean yeah. that's yeah that's i mean I, I, would, I would kind of like rule that you know comparison out as being a good one. Oh um, yeah for sure yeah no <laughs> yes uh, I, I but it, it's, I think it's, it's funny it's because the result really of uh, the early definition of narcissism which is not what we mean by narcissism today. You oh, know, yes, like, yes, yes. Wow. Yeah. It's first meaning, um, you know, it's really, uh, you know, just like being focused on the self and not being focused on the external world. So it's sort of like directing your energy and thoughts, you know, to your inner world. I love that. I love that. The, I always say it's egocentrism, the original definition right. of narcissism, with egocentrism, but that's now we know that narcissism is so much to do with status, anxiety mm -hmm. and grandiosity and vulnerability and protecting the, this, yourself from the status anxiety that you don't want to feel and all that. And so that's not schizoid either. <laughs> right. Yeah, though, though, yeah. though, if a schizoid is very yeah. egocentric, there's a very good reason why they are because they generally have no choice, but to be, there aren't very many options. Well, outside yeah, well, of that. well that's, that, that's a great point. That's the thing I want to talk about is that, so there's, there's a perceived egocentrism for schizoids, which is that you're not engaging with and doing the kinds of things that we think are good things to do. You're just off in your own little world doing your own thing. That's egocentric, right? And that's a, that's a similar thing that gets laid on autistic people, right? It's a similar uh, perception that autistic people are egocentric, that schizoid people are egocentric because they're not interested in the things that we're interested in. Right. Because there's, there's, there's a real difference in values, right? right. Well, they pass, we're, we're, we're not talking about just to be clear, we're not talking about egocentrism and like everything is about me. It's more like right. egocentrism is like, um, you know, you're in your own inner world and thinking about, you're not thinking about like external things as having a meaning about your own value. You're just sort of focused on what's going on in your own head at the right. expense of the outside world, if that makes yeah, sense. And, and unfortunately, the issue becomes when, uh, you don't align yourself with the values of um, your environment, uh, they tend to pathologize that. So, 
Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, uh, uh, sorry, Bert, were you going to? Oh, yeah. I, so, so anyway, we, we've just been going over some of the common things that people think about schizoids that aren't true, right? So th this is important work to do. Uh, the, the next yeah. part is to start talking about like what schizoid is. Yeah. You know? uh, so like, I think, you know, if you could, you know, give your perspective yeah, yeah. about I what it like actually one. is. Yeah. Yeah. We want your definition, yeah. your run. Right. Yeah. So I just wanted to address schizotypal because of what Burb was saying about it being important to make sure it's clear what is and what isn't schizoid. And schizotypal is another uh, one like avoidant. That That's a whole can of worms too. Yeah. Um, but, you know, in short, the difference is, and this is very reductionistic, right? This yeah. is like, you know, just down to the bare bones. It's obviously, you know, more nuanced, but basically, um, uh, so there's schizotypal has social isolation, um, which, you know, is from schizoid and avoidant, and it has, uh, it has fear of rejection and rejection sensitivity like avoidant. Um, and then what, makes it its own thing is the addition of uh, like um, attenuate, attenuated symptoms of psychosis. So schizotypal is like um, from avoidant, it has the fear of rejection from schizoid and avoidant has the social isolation. Mm -hmm. And then from, you know, the schizophrenia spectrum psychotic disorders, it has, you know, like uh, lighter versions or less severe, or less intense versions of delusions, which would be, you know, like unusual or odd beliefs and um, like a lesser version of hallucinations, which would be like unusual perceptual experiences. Yeah, I was watching a, a video produced by uh, a schizotypal girl about her own experiences. And what she was talking about was uh, how easily influenced she was. I, I wanna separate this out because, you know, in histrionic- oh, I, I know which one you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. In, histri in histrionic people, uh, that's part of it is being easily influenced, but the mechanism is very different, right? In histrionic, the mechanism is, oh, well, everybody is a friend and everybody is very competent. So uh, obviously I should believe you, right? It's like a priori. But with this uh, girl who's making this video, it, it really seemed like she would look over videos about like conspiracy theories or about different ways of viewing the world, very eccentric ways of viewing the world, which are just slightly mm -hmm. out of the norm. And it would be so difficult for her to do two things. One is to zoom in on the details to see any inconsistencies. And the second thing is to nest that belief within social context, right? Which is like, well, this person believes this on this website, but then how does that interact with the whole of the rest of how humanity perceives this thing, right? <laughs> so she, she couldn't concretize to get out of it and then she couldn't nest to get out of it. And that's, so these are two really important facets in understanding, I think, schizoid and schizophrenia spectrum is um, the opposite of concretization, which we'll call abstraction, right? Yeah. And I want, I want to make a critical difference here because it, this is this is what will come in is like well aren't schizophrenics not abstract because you know you give them a proverb test and um like you know does a rolling stone gather moss right and all the schizophrenics go well i don't know what that means right mm -hmm. it's, it's rolling as a stone rolling downhill what does that mean right and the thing is that when they're saying abstraction in that sense they're really combining two other mechanisms that they don't know they're combining they're combining the vagueness the abstractness of the thought the amount of unpacked the amount of packed information that it contains. And the second thing is the working memory of how much of the information of a domain you can nest at a, at a particular time, right? So for- Working for, memory. Yeah, and... working memory. So for that, and for to understand that analogy, you, this is what I use all the time just to get it across, is um, in order to understand a rolling stone gathers no moss, you have to have you have to nest the concept of a stone rolling with moss on it or not on it. You have to nest the concepts of a person not being in a place, a person moving either away through thoughts or away through the physical world from place to place, right? And not gathering valuable connections, not amassing resources, whatever it is. It's very abstract. There's a lot of potential that hasn't been unpacked here, right? Yeah. And in, in order to get the metaphor, you have to be able to do the abstract part and the nesting part. But if you ask people on schizophrenia spectrum questions about leaving and being drawn out of the world and drawing to different thoughts, they'll, they'll follow you through those modes of abstraction. In fact, there's a very uh, severely schizophrenic girl um, that I heard about in a, in a lecture who um, actually expressed the experience of being pulled away from the interpersonal 
domain. It's like, you're, it's like you're becoming a different person. It's like, I'm not here with you anymore. Like you're going away, what's happening, right? Um, and so, you know, you can see that that aspect of the, of the task that they gave them, they're fully capable of, but the nesting, they're not, right? And so, and so that's why it's important to make this distinction. Um, anyways, why was I saying this? Yeah, right. I, I know. <laughs> or, can you can you yeah. define nesting for me? Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. So um, this is just about uh, working memory. So let's say that you're looking at a domain and it's at a level of detail, right? Um, it, it could be any level of detail. You could be looking at God or you could be looking at the texture of a tree, right? It, it, whatever level of detail is fine. It's the amount of information that you can work with in the moment is your working memory rather than your recall. So it's like, I can memorize every knob on this tree and I know where they all are and I can hold them all in my head at the same time and I, I have names for all of them, right? And if your working memory closes in, then you can't nest as many of them. It's like doing it, running through a math equation, right? Like you have to do this step and this step and this step and this step, right? And so people who have expansive working memory, they can solve the math equation right away because they don't have to use the striatum. They don't have to put anything into their procedural memory, right? They can say, oh, it all makes sense, right? But someone with less working memory, they actually have to get each piece and put it into their procedural memory and then they can do the operations so it takes them longer to learn right and, this, and what affects yeah. working memory so, so where is nesting in that sorry uh so so when i say nesting what i mean is nesting context right so uh, an example for schizophrenia spectrum would be um so there's this belief that i hold you employing context in your working memory yeah exactly there's this belief that i hold in this domain right this part of the domain and i'm nesting that next to yeah. what somebody else thinks about the same thing and well how competent are they and what do other people think about them and if well, right right that, i don't yeah, contextual, exactly. i think yeah. contextualizing yeah. is another word yeah probably. nesting or contextualizing yeah 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 um, contextuality is good yeah. Too. yeah yeah anyway um so yeah I think, <laughs> yeah you yeah, know yeah, but so i think that's a really profound point about um you know the um the sayings uh I'm the like, proverbs yeah. the proverbs i can you know i give this test called the wyatt like every week where people have to read a passage about proverbs and uh i can't think of the name proverb it's ridiculous but uh, <laughs> <laughs> i don't know very many either yeah i mean Two birds I, one stone is that a proverb there's like you know, um shallow brooks are noisy fall seven times go to eight um, water under the bridge is that one does that count yeah yeah sure but it, it's i think you know the ability to understand that uh or to you know understand the context and use it in you know understanding and perceiving the world um you know is uh fundamentally or schizotypal disorder schizophrenia these are disorders i would say of meaning making um and in the ability of somebody's semantic memory to basically function or for, you know, different concepts to, uh, you know, form some sort of coherent narrative in their mind. What is an issue there is that oftentimes, um, if we're talking about people that are always in a different kind of space of thinking and as Burb uh, described the abstract uh, kind of uh, plane of thinking, Oftentimes there are a lot of narratives that are constructed and are consistent within that, that plane. Uh, I, but, I, I know where, I know where you're going. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know uh, exactly where you're going. Yeah. Thank you. But, but unfortunately many times um, that, that consistency in that narrative that's being constructed will not make sense to a person that is listening. That isn't like that, that doesn't experience things in that manner. And so when those type when those types of narratives are actually discussed among schizoids or among people, and uh, and and uh, as for those that don't know, I have a server. If you're uh, if you're diagnosed schizoid uh, or self-diagnosed, we have a vetting system. But in any case, uh, you can go to the Zoid Void on Discord. But um, a lot of the people when they're communicating narratives that normally wouldn't have made or didn't make sense to their locale, to their family, to their friends, to their normal environment, to the, I guess what would be a neurotypical environment. When they describe those narratives to other people within the server that are like them, that have this similar diagnosis, all of a sudden these narratives make easy sense. They make sense. Yeah, we hear I, them and we go, that makes sense. There, there's so much context. I understand the consistency. Yeah. I understand the context. I understand what you're trying to say with all that. Um, there is no need to, there is no, um, uh, what's the word? It's not disjointed like it's often described. Uh, a lot of those narratives like a lovely experience to me for people yeah 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 and it is because it allows uh people like this to actually um start regulating their moods and actually uh have uh simmering value 
similar values and start creating a, uh, I guess, some kind of pseudo community connection or human connection, because they hear other people going, oh, that makes sense. And then explaining why that makes sense to them. And then the explanation for why that makes sense makes sense to the person who said it. And so, uh, but Burr, I, I know you probably want to go off of this. Go a little yeah, more there's just so much it, context that we need to really understand. I am the king of vagueness. So. Yeah, you are. You are. It's infuriating yeah. for me. Um, yeah, I know it is. <laughs> and I still need to define yeah. schizo, what it is. Yeah, 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 right. yeah. Please, please go ahead. Yeah. No, go ahead. We'll get back. Okay. Back. Um, I mean, so where to start? I mean, you could start with the hip, you know ancient Greece and Hippocrates and Galen and uh, the theory of the four humors you know which was like <laughs> four different substances in yeah. the human body that determine your health and personality and one of the humors was phlegm mm -hmm. um, so there was the phlegmatic personality type and you know from my research that would be the closest you know historical historical precursor to what we now ha see as schizoid personality i think i think one of the number one historical precursors of that time would just look at diogenes and you're <laughs> Diogenes. Uh, I, I think I think Diogenes had more than just. No, just I know, Diogenes. I know. I'm joking. I'm joking. But Diogenes is a good. You're, you're Diogenes. I'm Diogenes for sure. But um, so uh, phlegm was ba but phlegm was basically like kind of like laziness. So I'm not sure why that's been considered the precursor to schizoid, but um, I guess. Well, it's probably because oh, oh, of the, I had, the I understand it completely. The, I understand completely. Yeah, why. no, I yeah. get it intuitively. I just have yeah. a hard time articulating. Oh, yeah. I can tell. I can. You want me to tell you why that? Do yeah, do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so. Um, so I've, we've, we've, I've separated the difference between um, a, a complicated theoretical working memory task and abstraction, right? We've separated those things, right? So you, could, you can abstract in a way that's completely nonsense, nonsense. Like it doesn't make sense. It's not useful in any way. Everyone's like, what are you talking about, right? It's like, well, God's speaking to me. Well, why is God abstract? Because he's everything and, you know, and created everything. And right, anyway, um, so there, and there's, so there's the concrete space, there's the abstract space, and then there's the interpersonal equidistant space, which is between the two. Um, and most people, most of the time, their concerns are about, well, what's the, where's the next meal going to come from? And well, what did you say to me on Friday? And well, how competent is that guy at our particular job or task, right? Why do people care so much about their next freaking meal? Like <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. You know that's you know. a lot. Well, uh, people constantly maybe because they want to take a picture of it later and put it on their Instagram. Yeah. That's probably yeah, that's why. Too. But, or, or they're or they're or they order. like to cook. Or they like to cook. Or they zoom in right. on it, right? They concretize cooking and they're very good at cooking and they get all their details precise and they feel very good about that, right? Like right. This, that's that's different. That I respect. That is yeah. That is different. Oh, yeah. okay. That 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 you can respect in your own arbitrary fashion. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Anyway. So right. um, yeah. Right. So most people, most of the time, are have their dopaminergic activity, their motivation and their, and their serotonin, their, their reward tied up in, in that space. And mm -hmm. schizoids are barely in that space at all. So, so as, as the, <laughs> the way I like to often describe it is, and I mentioned to you, I think uh, when we were talking, uh, Daniel, is yeah. that the, um, the equidistant individual has to meditate, go to church, have spiritual experiences or go to special places and talk to special people to have these kind of profound abstract, uh, forms of thinking and experience and and so on and so on it, it, it's a time and a place because it expends a lot of energy it takes a lot out of them it's a special situation and a special type of energy that's being um used in order to get to those places right well i still haven't answered the question which is well, why they're perceived as lazy i never right. oh okay there. yeah okay but po my point being just that that uh, what the uh schizoid has why, to do why did the people who are linking you know phlegm to schizoid not making that link explicit in the literature why well, the reason they're called ahead, lazy, yeah, the reason, the reason, <laughs> tangent, they're called reason lazy is because from the perspective of these equidistant people, they're not interested in any of the things they care about, or they're not doing it, right? Well, you're lazy because you're, what does that mean? Well, you're not doing the things that I want you to do. So you're lazy, <laughs> right? That's it. Yeah. I mean, it's that's not that it. complicated. That's you're, the not, other, yeah. you're not accomplished. You're not competent at the task that I consider to be valuable. And yeah. thus you are lazy. Well, it, well, it's not even competent because they're not even doing it. There's no chance to observe their competence because they're not doing it at all. Yeah. But if they do it, <laughs> they probably do it in a very sluggish, uninterested or poor oh, yeah. way. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So there's, there's, so there's the, well, well, then that you can see how that would be internalized to to mm -hmm. create an avoidant personality within a schizoid right so you um other people see you doing these things sluggishly and not very engaged because you don't really care about them right mm -hmm. uh and then they externalize incompetence on you which then if they're your in-group if they're a parent or a 
friend or a girlfriend or a boyfriend or a brother, they then you might trust them, right? And you might go, oh, well, I am lazy and I am incompetent, right? Oh man, I, oh, I feel so much shame. Well, I don't want to be, I don't want to make people feel bad with my presence by not being good at things. And then there you go. You're, <laughs> you have yeah, this, yeah, uh, you have, sl- you have sluggish, yeah. you have phlegm, you have yeah. loogies yeah. and everything else. But, but uh, okay, just going back really quick, because I think this is important. It's, it's that, the amount of effort and energy that a schizoid has to expend or someone on the schizophrenic spectrum, as we will you know, continue talking about, uh, has to expend it in order to be in the equidistant plane and in that kind of interpersonal world is just as much as it is for an equidistant person to go into these other places that, that require them to, say, to meditate or have um, be in a, a setting and expend a certain amount of energy to experience. Um, it, those, those abstract places, you know, or, or study philosophy or, or wax philosophical they're, they're not going to be doing that intuitively all the time uh it, it, it's it's a time and a place generally for a lot of that to happen um but the schizoid is always there in some regard or another uh always it, it's wants in, to be there always stuff. wants to be there yeah. well yeah, yeah because it's comfortable not We're because often, it's it, it, not not because it's safe there, you know. yeah, and, yeah and it's not my argument is that it's not because it's safe right because it's oh it's away from the interpersonal and so thus it's safe because the it interpersonal be is so scary yeah. It, uh, maybe but but my opinion and, and like i would like to hear what the answer think. is a little bit of both a little bit of both yeah absolutely <laughs> but but, like but my, my conclusion in my dissertation it's a little bit of both a little, a little bit, bit of both, of both. Yeah. but but the the issue being that it, it's not intuitive to be in the interpersonal well right. well well also it's not just it also i want to clarify we got to expand and run the permutation it. it's a little bit of both and it's one and it's the other depending on the individual, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, you, yeah. So, so, so we have these mechanisms that we've, that we've sort of laid out, right? And I'm sure you understand how disassociation in a sense of motivation and dopamine works and the dis- distinction between um, how they talk about disassociation when you're living in a fantasy world versus when you don't have any interest to do anything. One has lots of dopamine, the other has none, right? Um, and they're both called disassociation. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah. now that you've brought up dissociation, I don't think there's any stone in the semantic network of schizoid that we've left unturned. Yes, indeed, indeed. Um, so there's so these there's these mechanisms that, that we're looking at here. And now what we should do is we should take all these mechanisms and we should combine them into a cohesive picture of a of the schizoid phenomenon, right? Yeah. Um, so and also, but that also gets us into the cluster A as a larger uh, spectrum and schizophrenia spectrum as as larger than that. So yeah, the schizophrenia yeah. spectrum, I think, yeah. is pretty fascinating. What are your uh, thoughts? You know, I mean, I think it's a fascinating theory. Um, I was compelled by it when I was reading about it. Um, so I'm a fan of the the conceptual framework. I mean, what it suggests is that um, there's a continuum of functioning from, you know, like normal to schizophrenic. And so in schizophrenia, you've lost you know, contact with reality. You're like no longer responding to external cues. You're responding to your own internal cues. Um, and then there's other behaviors like disorganization, and, um, mm-hmm. you know, flat affect or um, hearing things or seeing things or yeah, positive symptoms. Yeah, positive symptoms things. and negative symptoms. Um, and uh, originally, you know, the sort of schizophrenia spectrum hypothesis of psychopathology started really with Emil Kraepelin, who's considered the father of descriptive psychiatry and the DSM in general, who thought that, you know, there were basically only two mental disorders. There was um, dementia praecox, which was the historical name for schizophrenia, and there was manic depressive psychosis. And within each of these two categories, there's a continu- continuum of like, you know, subclinical traits that resemble, you know, the full-blown psychopathology, but are nowhere near as intense and are not, you know, pathological. Mm-hmm. It's just sort of someone is, uh, has, you know, dementia precox light or manic, depre- manic, de- uh, manic depressive psychosis light or something. Um, and then, so along the spectrum, you go from like, you know, normal personality traits to, pathological personality traits that, you know, resemble more and more, you know, what we think of as the condition of schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. Um, And so Kraepelin thought there was a personality style that could be identified that he called the pre-morbid schizophrenia personality, or, you know, the personality that's at risk for developing schizophrenia. And this personality was thought to, um, 
you know, possess the traits of schizophrenia, but like I said, in a lesser degree. And these traits, um, you know, are often have been described as sort of the shrinking away from reality and, you know, finding everything in life to be insurmountable and uh, sort of withdrawing into the self and to in one's own sort of reality. Um, and uh, I think what he described as the pre-morbid schizophrenia or the at-risk personality for schizophrenia um, does resemble uh, definitions of schizoid personality disorder um, in the DSM when it got split from avoidant PD mm -hmm. um, that focus on schizoid PD. It really, after the DSM-3, schizoid PD basically became negative symptom schizophrenia light. Um, and I think that's a problem. Uh, and I don't think of schizo schizoid personality disorder that way, but I think that um, basically, uh, you know, a, a, a descriptive psychiatry viewpoint or the current viewpoint in the DSM would view schizoid personality disorder um, like negative symptom schizophrenia light. Do you know what I mean by negative schizophrenia? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, in that's fact, definitely. It, yeah, I can. I can no, well, this is what's interesting this, yeah. is that um, I think. Would you agree, Burr, that we kind of hold a opposing position to the one that they're describing? That they describe? Uh, well, yeah, I, I can explain. We our kind position. of see that. As, explain, yeah, but go ahead. Explain. Yeah, I'll explain position. the position, which is it's complicated. So, yeah, yes, I've indeed. been building up to it by going through all. Let, let me just preface before you talk. I just yeah. want to say I'm describing a position, not my position. Oh, of course, yes, of course. No, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yes. yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, we. So I've laid out these mechanisms, and now I'm going to try to combine them all to sort of get at this point that we're that we're on now: schizophrenia spectrum and how the DSM views it. Um, how to start? How to get into it? So if we've sure. if we've established that um, to the schizoidness. Uh, there's a there's a tendency to want to be over the over the equidistant. There's a there's a there's a tendency to want to think in categories um, uh, that that to think ab above the everyday activities, not in terms of like I'm better than them, but just in terms of well, what are the ways that people behave? Look at, looking at all these different ways that people behave, and then going that's not for me. That's not what for is me. That's behavior. not for me. Right, and having having li having links of understanding of how domains work as related to each other, but then not necessarily doing any of those things. Right, this observer, this top down, the ultimate uh, voyeur. <laughs> yeah. Um, so when and we know that working memory is destroyed by stress, right? Uh, we know it's an, it's an inverted U with stress and, and sleep. Um, so when you take a person who has this very broad perspective and you stress them out significantly and diminish their working memory capacity, you get a person who's looking at an abstraction through a telescope, right? They're, you're looking at a massively packed part of the world through a very limited ability to nest information. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And so what will happen essentially, and as we've talked about nesting, contextualizing, contextualizing being, yeah. right, being able to reference with other people about what our beliefs about the world are, right? This, there's an element of reality which is socially constructed because, of course, not everybody can be an autistic special interest about every subject, right? But they still have beliefs that hold with the general uh, beliefs of, of the environment around them. So we're talking, now we're talking about really the mechanism for this, for this spectrum, right? So there's a set of people which is predisposed to be the ones that are thinking about what the gods want and dancing in the rain, dancing so that they'll cause the rain in like this, in, a, in like uh -huh. an ancient, yeah. an ancient there's, and there's people who are predisposed to be wanting to sharpen spears. So they're as sharp as they can possibly be. Right. Yeah. So when you take a person with, with no yeah. interest in war, yeah, exactly. No interest in war, just to sharpen the spears. Um, and then there's people who use the spears, right. And then are justified by the gods in the middle. Right. <laughs> so when you take a person who has a predisposition to want to be wondering what the gods want, because that in, in that culture, that would be the most abstract thing that anybody could do. Right. What is everything? Well, it's a person personality. Well, what is what can we do to make that personality like us? Well, we so that they'll rain, it'll rain because it controls the rain. Well, we dance, right? That's quite, quite abstract, right? Um, and if somebody were doing that in the modern day, we would say, oh, you're schizotypal. Mm -hmm. But we wouldn't say that they were schizotypal in that culture, 
right? right. And, and in fact, there's <laughs> right. many cultures today in which uh, somebody that would be diagnosed schizotypal would probably merely be considered a a, a soothsayer of sorts yeah. in, in a different uh, culture. Right. So yeah, so absolutely. The, that's yeah. and that's true for schizophrenia too. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That exactly. Culture. You know what would be diagnosed that way would and, not. And just, just and that's just, especially true true for children, by the way. Yeah. Um, in different cultures like a kid will you know from one culture might report you know that they're seeing like the devil or something appear at night which you know in one psyche ER are might be a psychotic child and another might just be you know the religion they're seeing the, devil. <laughs> yeah, seeing the devil it's a different different context we right? better start pouring yeah. salt on the doorway yeah, yeah. So, so this is complicated but i think I'm, I'm getting really close to it which is that so there's this underlying gradient of neurodiversity and you get, you might get an extreme expression of that. Like, a, like somebody who's like Alan Watts on steroids, like all he can do mm -hmm. is sit around waxing about the nature of being. And everyone's like, well, this is so interesting. Let's give you some food. Right. But if they weren't giving him food, he'd just <laughs> die. He would just yeah, die. Yeah. Right. Or he would be yeah. uh, under your nearest uh, uh, overpass. Right, exactly. Uh, living, yeah. living under a bridge yeah. of sorts. But he so. got lucky. He got lucky because he he grew up in a context where his needs were provided for, and he wasn't stressed out so much, and he didn't have a predisposition towards more severe ADHD symptoms. So working memory good. Working memory good, right? And so then, well, now he's just that guy rather than a schizophrenic. He's just that dude who says those things that we're interested in, right? Or, or yeah. Uh, yeah, name name every. Yeah. He's uh, what's it called? Um, Andy Kaufman. He's right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but then you you take that person and you. So you exp expose them to some trauma and you have a, you know, a predisposition towards working memory issues, right? And so then you, the more stress you expose them to, um, the harder it is for them to nest context. They can't concretize too well, so they can't find out the details to figure out whether, whether their belief is accurate or, or not accurate. They have to sort of flow based on how, what other people's perceptions of it are. And of course, that's been destroyed by the stress, right? And so their beliefs get a little weirder, <laughs> a little more outside of context, right? A little, just a little bit, right? They might be in the same vein of philosophy, but they'll be talking about Kierkegaard in a way that everyone else goes, that's not what he meant, or, you know, and whether they're wrong or right is, well, I don't know. But the point is that, you know, each time their working memory gets hit, it becomes more difficult for them in the next, con next context. They're already not a concretizer. So they just get further and further and further out of an interpretation of sense data that other people would agree with. Well, then, well, another thing that happens is that because they're not so equidistant, they don't really care about dressing themselves in a way that appeals to other people so much, right? And so they dress a little odd. And they might not take care of their body as well as other people do. And then that alienates them from other people. Because and the context, causes, the, the context yeah. required to yeah. care about that is being ignored or uh, devalued because yeah. it's not a context that matters to them. Yeah. And so the, so the idea is that there's, it's a spectrum from that guy who's really into existential philosophy and dresses weird and kind of smells bad <laughs> to somebody with- And with doesn't pay his bills. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you just keep going, right? If you just keep going, it looks more and more and more schizophrenic to a point where, you know, he really can't take care of his body at all. And he's it, alienated and shamed. His working memory is closing and he's looking, it's like right. his perception is like a, like a, like an angel on a pin, essentially, and, right? And, and Goal. that person so, so this is this is you know i think you know highlights the distinction between schizotypal and schizoid which is these you know psychotic light symptoms mm -hmm. yeah. which uh i'm sure any you know someone with schizoid could get there but it's not you know part of the the definition of the syndrome itself right. Yeah, but, but but idiosyn idiosyncratic beliefs oh, okay. are though. Yeah, <laughs> idiosyncratic thing. beliefs, yeah. Uh, yeah. eccentric beliefs. The only difference is that a lot of the times the schizoid idiosyncratic and eccentric are not DSM criteria for schizoid. Well, I mean, they, they they're often described uh, for uh, for schizoids and schizotypal. But they certainly are for schizotypal. They're you know. Yeah, yeah, but that's what's interesting. It, it should be idiosyncratic. Yes, uh, yes it should I be agree. for schizoids yeah. because I've never that, met. A, yes, totally. I've never met a, a, a I've met hundreds of schizoids at this point so in, never... the DS, in the dsm one and two schizoid personality disorder was conceptualized as a combination of avoidant schizoid and schizotypal from dsm three and beyond well, it's it, it was akstars right that still mentions Ak video yeah Ak Akstar. yeah Ak the, yeah they still yeah. mentioned yeah. idiosyncratic that's what i was talking about when yeah I was yeah they, they still mention idiosyncratic yeah. thinking but this is what's funny two things um that thinking, that the idiosyncratic thinking is so prevalent. I've never met a single schizoid, that's, especially one that's diagnosed, that doesn't have what would be considered to be idiosyncratic thinking because their mm -hmm. value system and their thoughts and their intuition 
constantly flies into what is what is known as the abstract yeah. when it comes to a lot of things. They're always asking questions like, why do people care about things? Why do people care about holidays? Why do people care about parties? Why do people care about this? I don't understand. Why don't they care about this and this and that and this and this one so, great and cosmic thing? And um, go, let, so there's, go ahead, there's go ahead. an interesting point there, I think, about understanding, um, not understanding why people care about things and being confused about that yeah. and just being like, you know, people care about this and I don't people are stupid or, you know, whatever. Well, hey, hold on, but before you go on, that's 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 exactly the kind of personality or interpretation difference that I was getting to earlier in the sense that being mm -hmm. a schizoid is independent of whether the rationalization is, oh, um, I'm bad because I don't share their values or they're bad because they don't share my values, mm -hmm. right? And both of those are options, right? right. So, yeah, 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 totally. So it, I think the schizoid personality is a dynamic that, you know, uh, can be, um you know i'm not as good and so i will hurt them or i'm not as good so they're going to reject me I, or they're not as good so fuck them yes or, yeah. no yeah and no in exactly or they're not interesting so yeah. whatever i don't know yeah, I, yeah. I i have to point this out because i always like to give examples of what i've seen and so uh, as far as those two instances whether it's the externalizing of incompetence or the internalizing of incompetence right both those things are either more prevalent than the other, usually not, uh, or, or somewhat balanced in every schizoid I've talked to, right? It's um, in, in most cases, though, though, I generally see uh, externalized incompetence, right? These, so, these differences really, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but map on really nicely to the different personality disorders in cluster A and the schizophrenia spectrum. Like, you know, oh, yeah. external, to use your language, externalizing, um, what is it, externalizing the other person? Competence? In, incompetence. Co yeah. Incompetence and competence. As, in, 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 as the other person is incompetent or the other person as dangerous? Oh, you know, ex externalizing incompetence would be um, you are not competent, so you're not worth my time, right? You're. Right. Yeah, I yeah. see. Okay. And, and internalizing incompetence is I am not worth your time. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, about, and so I see both. Externalizing of those. malice. Oh, that's outgroup. That's what that's we outgroup. Say, outgroup. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. talk about that too. Outgroup, in group. Okay. In so if I, in -group, if I were to put a personality disorder label to these different hmm. solutions, I would, you know, externalizing malice is paranoid person. Yes, 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 yes. You, yes, got, you it. got it. You oh got my it. god, he got it. Of course, I got it. I you know. <laughs> no, you're, you're, nature. I've been immersed in this yeah. for. No, no, no. Yeah. Absolutely. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah. Um, uh, but. But the, 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 what, I, what I was going to say is the um, the other aspect, too, is that you talked about the psychosis um, being in the schizotypal or, a, 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 you know, my, more mild psychosis or whatever. What, what's interesting is I, I myself, including other schizoids that I've talked to, also experience this when their stress levels and anxiety levels have become too high. Well, their working mm -hmm. memory closes in. Yeah. So once right? their working memory yeah. starts closing in significantly, they've told me I've had episodes that I hid from everyone for like where a week or two, I couldn't differentiate what was happening around me. Reality was essentially warping and I felt disassociated or derealized for like a week straight. Um, I didn't know what was happening. Um, yeah. And I and like in my case, um, I had, you know, a new I had a new baby. I was going to school. I was working a full time job, right? I'm doing yeah. all these things and dealing with Gotta all this other shit. Real quick, when that happens. Yeah. yeah, and that'll stress out a regular person, yeah. much less a fucking covert schizoid, right? And so when all that was adding up, along with a bunch of other stuff, for a good week straight, I was terrified of everything, irrationally terrified of everything. So I, and I'm a horror buff, right? I'm a big horror buff, I'm a big horror nut. I couldn't watch the movies I normally watch. I couldn't read the comics I normally read. I couldn't play the video games I normally play. I couldn't listen to the music I normally listen to. I had to basically just, all my free time was spent just being as calm, in calming situations as possible because I was terrified of everything because any little thing, like I would think about, I don't know, some. I would think about a, 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 any concept and then it would turn into this and this and it would, it would extend itself all the way into this existential dread and nihilism. Right. Mm. Well, and I'm sure angst, I don't have, I mean, I, we don't have to tell no, you about this. I deal with the same shit. Like, on yeah, yeah, basis. yeah. And yeah. so, so for that week straight, I was in a state of panic and existential dread that I couldn't shake off until eventually my stress levels from the external world reduced. And so my working memory expanded 
And so thus I was able to contextualize things a little better, a lot better. And then guess what? I was able to slowly get back to my normal hobbies and interests. Yeah. And I think this, maybe the solitude or whatever, you know, well, in my you know, case, it wasn't solid. <laughs> you you know, I think that enabled you to re, you know, constitute yourself. And Oh yeah. Yeah. I had to just like yeah. check out um, yeah. uh, in every way possible. Totally. Uh, emotionally or, or whatever uh, in order to, to, so yeah, I was in a state of just like, when I wasn't panicking, I was in a state of anhedonia. Yeah. And, um, and, and uh, anhedonia and just disassociation. So um, an anxious anhedonia construct. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So, so, let's, so uh, yeah, I just wanted to convey that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, the, I'm the guy, I'm the guy that says the kind of experiential shit. So yeah, that look, the Zoids so, watch and go, I, I, I do the things, you know? So, so two things yeah. to try to make a narrative. Um, you know, one is that working memory deficits are common among schizotypal, schizoid. Oh, all of them. Cluster A, yeah. all of them, right? Nonverbal learning disability, ADHD, NPD, BPD. <laughs> and I'm sure, you know, there's, you know, some, I mean, autism, that kind of category has been kind of convert. It's become like one mangled mess. We'll, we'll get into that. Don't worry. <laughs> all right. But, you know, so I kind of rather just not even talk about it. But, oh, no, I could give you tools to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's hard to, uh, you know, grapple with because it's you know it's a it's a touchy subject too and it's also conceptually we love touchy subjects oh, we did. Um, but anyway i don't know about working memory and autism because there's a lot of debates about well uh the, the person well, you're speaking to is autistic memory, so hello, hello. Working memory nonverbal yeah. disability hello hello autistic yeah. yeah i mean i burb you know um I would assume as Asperger's and now that would be called autism, high functioning autism. Oh no, I'm actually quite low functioning. <laughs> yeah. I literally can't leave, I can't leave my house. I can't like, I can't leave my house. It's like, it's just constant. Burb, uh, don't, just don't, don't get, uh, don't get it, but don't get it mixed up. Burb uh, is, is good at conversations uh -huh. like that are very topical. Technical. I'm good at technical, technical conversations. Um, that's, that's about it. <laughs> I, I mean, I honestly, I can't even say, you have anything or you don't have anything because right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've heard as you're talking and you seem perfectly well related. And I think, you know, most people listening would probably perceive that. Oh, well, we, well no, yeah. in this, in this domain, I'm well related because it's a special interest. Yeah, right? yeah. I zoom uh, in this domain. I have stuff to say, um, but yeah. yeah well, I've got a controversial thing to say. It's not like schizoid people cannot be well related. At that's time. true. That's true. Yeah. It's true. No, no, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Yes. Yeah, so I just wanted to highlight working memory at the working memory deficits that you guys point out, you know, experientially, and I'm sure there's empirical evidence, you know, I think that provides support for the idea that there is a schizophrenia spectrum and that schizoid personality disorder is somewhere on that spectrum or wouldn't share this feature in common with all these other, uh, you know, syndromes considered to be on the spectrum. They all have this underlying feature of working memory deficits. Well, I think the important distinction here is like, if you see a person who has a working memory deficit, but it's in the domain of um, uh, uh, building desks with hammers, right? And it's really difficult for them to nest all the instructions to be able to complete the, the project mm -hmm. and they fail, you would never call that schizophrenia. But if, no. you see, if you see a person who's going, well, if you, back to that ridiculous concept of, uh, you know, everyone else has stopped dancing in the dancing for the rain, but this person hasn't, right? And you see, well, it's, it's a Polsky says it's just context, but it's really context and content, right? Because worrying about whether you're able to build a desk is very different from worrying about what the nature of being is. What does God want, right? Oh, and right. there's, there's what does God want in social context with lots of working memory? And there's building a desk in social context with lots of working memory. And then there's a restricted ver working memory version of both. And the restricted ver working memory version of what does God want, we call schizophrenia. And the restricted working memory version of building a desk, we call ADHD. And the restricted uh, working memory version of being neurotypical, what do we just call it, incompetence? <laughs> oh, no, I mean, the ADHD, I already covered it. Oh, right? okay, okay, yeah. that's true. Well, that's here, true. Well, the oh, yeah. the restricted I'm that player to ADHD. I think ADHD is somewhat atypical, you know? Yeah. Well, no, I mean, it, when I say ADHD, I just, I just think about 
I just think about these working memory differences across a spectrum of different behaviors, right? Yeah. So, so I mean, when I say working memory deficits and ADHD, they're kind of synonymous for me, right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, um, because it's a mechanism. I mean, it's a mechanism that underlies so much of BPD as well in terms of the splitting and the not being able to contextualize working it. memory deficits and BPD. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. BPD. <laughs> that's that's a, it's that's stress. A, that's a it's all stress. I mean, that's yeah, a different, more, that's more a stress equals um, working memory deficits. It's as simple as that. Well, just just just, uh, just I know yeah, that yeah, Roy yeah. Bowmeister would agree, and that everyone on Twitter would not. Well, yeah, that's that's fine. Fuck Twitter, Twitter, Twitter can Twitter. Can, no, I'm uh, a fan yeah. of Roy. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so let, let's pull out for a second because we've been we talked about autism for a second. We've been talking about these different different spectrums, and then you for a minute we were talking about working memory in autism, right? Yeah. Um, Which I was just saying, I you know yeah. I can't say with the same level of confidence I can say that working memory deficits underlie you know nonverbal learning disability often certainly ADHD um, and are found consistently in research looking at the neuropsychological functioning of people with schizophrenia, schizotypal personality disorder, schizoid personality disorder. Um, but I just, uh, I think the findings regarding autism are, are more inconsistent. Yeah, that, that, would, that would make sense because in, in autism, right? I, autism is not caused by a working memory deficit, but mm -hmm. If you have autism and a working memory deficit, you are especially impaired because mm -hmm. an autistic person it, it, to do the same yeah. task has to see a hundred things where a regular person sees five, right? Because of this hyper detail perception, which is in the literature and the, the eye studies and, and all that, like they definitely are detail processors, right? If yeah. you have limited working memory and you're autistic, it's so difficult to function because not only do you have to perceive more objects than other people to do the same task, your ability to perceive any objects at all is, is, is limited. Um, and so you're essentially looking at a very complicated domain through a telescope, right? And it becomes very difficult to do, to do uh, daily activities, right? A yeah, microscope also, in that yeah, case. Yeah, microscope, <laughs> yeah. But, but also at the same time, having autism actually forces your working memory to be better. Because in order to do the same task, you have to nest more information, right? Um, so uh, it is, I often get into trouble where I'm in a domain, right? And to do the same thing, I have to say a whole paragraph. Another person would just go one, two, two sentences. Yeah, it drives right? me insane. It drives <laughs> me fucking insane, yes. A anyway, so uh, there's autism is associated with cortical overgrowth. Schizophrenia spectrum is, is uh, associated with cortical thinning. Autism is associated, I believe, with lots of glutamate. Schizophrenia spectrum might be associated with less glutamate. Ketamine, which restricts glutamate, gives you the symptoms of the negative and the positive symptoms of schizophrenia, which is interesting, right? So there's all these parallels. And different can we you know, yeah. categorically separate um, autism from schizoid then? Yes. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the, in, in this model, they're opposites. Yeah, right? yeah. They're actually opposites, right? Autistic people concretize too much, and schizoid people don't concretize enough. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and I want to clear, and I want to say something here, and that it is that because uh, it, it often doesn't get mentioned. Uh, all those variations are just as useful if integrated into the proper setting and environment, and if the stress levels of those individuals is decreased and the working memory is increased, then you have very productive, useful members of society. Well, we're talking about specialist brains versus generalist brains, right? Yes. We have brains that are that are designed to do a few things, but not much else very well, right? Yes. Um, and if, if those people aren't identified and the environment isn't set up for them, then they're not going to be very useful at all it's because be they're going to be struggling to care for their basic needs. But if they were nested in a family environment with understanding, totally. and support, then they could be very useful, right? That's why, you know, at yeah. Google, you've got like a whole floor of like schizoid like engineers, you know, basically in a womb like cocoon work environment. And they're like well, doing yeah. the most amazing work ever. But yeah, they, you know, some the, of them are schizoid, some of them are autistic, right? Depending yeah. on what they're doing. Yeah. Right. <laughs> no, yeah, absolutely. And if it, and but if it's staying on topic, they probably it's been, get along. It's being anyway, accommodated so. to them to optimize their functioning. I well, think. The, the next, I think the next thing is to really talk about because my initial response was to go, well, those are mostly autistics because they're engineers. Mm -hmm. And then and now I was like, oh, but that might look bad. But then I realized that we've already gone over this. Like the thing that schizoids are often naturally great at is psychology. Yes. Yeah. 
because psychology yeah, yeah. is about the problems that persist across domains, right? <laughs> I think psychology probably has the most schizoids. Yes, no, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, we talk yeah. about how psychotherapy yeah. is like yeah. the, the breeding ground for it is totally. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. that's why it's so outrageous to me that there are people arguing in psychology to remove schizoid PD from the DSM altogether. They're trying to remove, they want to remove themselves, themselves. <laughs> which actually makes sense. <laughs> now yeah, that I think about it, yeah. is that the is that the grand conspiracy? It's <laughs> always going. That we want bad. to not exist. Yeah. Erase that, us. Yeah. <laughs> to, to be a, to, to understand schizoid as a psychologist is to understand parts of yourself that you haven't been paying attention to. Yeah, and it's intense. I mean, it's intense to learn about it. I mean, just doing the research on my dissertation involved reading you know, these people from like the 1920s or the late 1800s who had just had these like raw biting descriptions of people that, you know, like resonate in this like core terrifying way. And I do think, you know, studying schizoid phenomena um, as someone who can identify with it is a particularly interesting rabbit hole to go down. Yeah, and, and what's fascinating is uh, when you're like this too, when you're, when you're this, 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 focused in this honed in on these non equidistant uh, ways of thinking is you often don't really put much uh, merit in things like college degrees, uh, titles, status, oh, and, and, and distrust so, of institutions, distrust of institutions, you're now in a forest. I know. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't care. Yeah, you can see my be wherever you want. Yeah, have fun. Yeah, have fun uh, I like yeah. that one. That one's pretty. I spent cool. like an hour on, you know, yeah. blowing, no, do your blowing thing. shopping some weird photo. I mean, that's kind of odd. Uh, but, but but what was I? What was I saying before I got distracted by the image? Verb. What was I saying? Help oh, me. You, you, okay. Uh, the ge the generalized learning thing and the distrust of institutions. Like. Oh um, yeah 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 exactly. Yeah. And so a lot of the people that I come across because there's often this kind of uh, I wouldn't say it's like a stereotype but that a lot of schizoids are they, they, a lot of them are fairly well read uh they're well read they're they're someone i guess considered to be someone intelligent uh and all this sort of stuff there's a lot of stereotypes surrounding them but also I, nice i would say yeah yeah i mean they're, they're polite if, if that's what yeah. you mean yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, generally polite. Well, here, let me explain why. No, hold on, hold on, hold on. But, but, um, oh, Jesus, go ahead, Burb. I, I can't, I, I, I can't nest information he, right now. He, he said, he, he said, he said, he said schizos are nice. And I think the reason is not so much because of what they do do, but because of so much of what they don't, don't do. do. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like there's yeah. so many, there's so much dopaminergic activity used in the equidistant space to undercut people and assess competence. And the schizo is like, I don't There's no reward. There's no reward. Well, I'm there. glad that you brought up dopamine, right? Yeah. We were talking about working memory. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there's no reward or, system. And we're talking about schizophrenia. So we yeah. have to dopamine at some point. Yeah. Um, you know, and the relationship between dopamine and schizoid personality and what would happen if you gave someone with schizoid personality more or less dopamine, I think are really interesting questions. Oh, it's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I, I just don't, you know, have a guess on that. I do. <laughs> I oh, have Burb, a guess on everything. Yeah, Burb has a guess on all so that. The, the, the problem with, with that whole thing is that with schizophrenic, so we know that dopamine. Too much dopamine is, is like schizophrenia. Well, yeah, but we know that that people, we need to have more working memory. We give them dopamine. Right. right? But we also know that schizophrenics have fucked working memory. <laughs> right. But, but they so, have too much dopamine, theoretically. Right. So, yeah. So, so here, here's the idea, right? So it's that there are parts of the brain, maybe in the rostral prefrontal cortex, which are associated with abstraction, right? Where I actually think that's the temporal lobe. Oh, it was temporal. I lobe? thought about this, yeah, somewhat. Okay, like, like where yeah, the you have your own theory, the, the, the neural substrate of meaning making hmm. is really, I think, in Wernicke's area. Okay, okay, sure. Um, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert in that domain, but anyway, so there's areas, yeah, yeah, there's 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 areas of the brain for for somebody on schizophrenia spectrum where when you pump dopamine or motivation into it, it actually destroys the rest of the brain and builds that little part up in the sense that there are problems that they're processing, which have no solution, right? Which are, which are, which are deadlock problems, essentially. They're abstract problems. They're like everybody, like we're, we exist. Why am I thing. real? People, well, people like, what's the distinction? <laughs> yeah. the distinction How do you solve that one? Bro? And avoid How do you solve well, that one, bro? So, you know, we're, we're in this space and people are being just deleted from view around us randomly, right? Like, mm -hmm. and why are, what, what the heck? Um, so look, okay, I'll, I'll use a specific example for me and my positive symptoms. So I'm always struggling 
with these, they're almost, they're almost, sometimes they become delusions, right? Of things growing in my body, right? And so when you, when you give me more dopamine, right? One of two things will happen depending on where that dopamine goes. If that dopamine goes into me studying music or math, right? If that's what I happen to be doing, then I go and study music and math a lot. I'm motivated to do that. If the dopamine goes into the circuits involved in those thoughts about things growing in my body, I'm more motivated to act on the problems of something being in my body, right? Which is, uh, could, be, like, we could like, get messy. Uh, yeah, not everyone though, right? Um, is going to uh, let the, I guess, you know, kind of lean into the dopamine rush associated with, um, you know, whatever sort of like non-productive thing you're doing. Um, or what did you, sorry, I'm a little bit out of it. What did you just say? Uh, I, what I was, I was saying was um, when I, when you give me a stimulant, like if I take caffeine yeah, right. or something, it's, Adderall. It's, it's either, it's either, or either I become delusional or I become super proficient at something right. that I'm trying to do. It's one or the other. Right. And it's, right, because, right. it's depending on where the neuroplasticity is going. Right. And so if it hits the productivity, well, then that makes me feel better and other people value me. Right. And then my stress comes down. Right. And then my working memory expands more, but if it hits the delusional circuit, right. Then that causes a bunch of stress. Right. Then, yeah. I, then, then it sends, then it, dop it it sends to dopamine. Delusional yeah. circuit right. and it, exactly. It sends circuit. dopamine Next away. You no, know, yeah. you know, you've got your own, you know, reality that you're living. Exactly. Right. It sends, yes. it sends dopamine away from all of the other areas of the DLPFC and the prefrontal cortex, all of the other areas are going to sleep. It's sending it all to the amygdala and the striatum yeah. and all these patterns that I've developed to try to deal with the, with the, with the threat essentially. Right. right. So, so I guess the, the, the interesting question is then what is going to determine whether dopamine gets, you know, channeled into the delusional or the, um, in performance enhancing. I would argue the environment. I think it's time. I think it's, it's time, time, and, time the environment. and the environment. Yeah. yeah. It's like, it's the time when you give them the dopamine of what stage of the, of the, of thought think, they're in. I think yeah. you're right. I think it's a totally time environment. The, yeah. The context of the situation. I, I, I also think that it has to do with the person's, you know, emotional and psychological development, yeah. their ability to self-regulate their defensive yeah. functioning. Well, um, what what happens to a, a regular person if you give them hallucinogens at the wrong or right time in their life? Cray cray. Yeah. It depends, right? Yeah, it, it depends. depends. Yeah. You give them mushrooms, you give them a, you have they have a DMT trip or something like that. They're gonna have a very different experience depending on their stress levels, Absolutely. working memory, and and what what the hell is happening that day, yeah. and, and what movie they watched earlier. <laughs> everything else they're gonna have, like, to have a bad trip or think, a great one what are schizoid attitudes towards hallucinogenics like mushrooms well, uh i could uh tell you a few stories, I, my uh, not feeling my would be that they would be fear and you'd want to okay avoid. no this is what's interesting is um i've heard a lot of both but um i've uh, a lot of schizoids have told me that they enjoy them because it allows them to actually start um, it, unless it's a hedonia because they start experiencing and interacting with things that they value more and so thus they start having like feelings of like euphoria or or one, se one second hold on i, I have so to go you're saying second, schizoid right people that you know dislike anhedonia i mean would it say that again in your view people with schizoid personality disorder would like to get rid of this anhedonia well i mean they, they'd like to get rid of it the problem is is that they often don't have a a, uh, a frame of reference as to how they could and not just because of chemical reasons but because they're not in any environments or any place that they feel is productive in regards to their own interests yeah. and values. And look, depend, you know, there's a lot of variation within people with schizoid, you know, personalities such that, oh, yeah. you know, like there's just a lot of differences in terms of level of functioning. I mean, you, someone who, uh, sorry, sorry, I'm back. I'm back. No, you're good. Bird. What did I miss? What did I miss? I don't even nothing, know nothing. what I'm saying right now. So, oh. Are you, are you that tired <laughs> yeah it's okay uh, but uh uh Burr, yeah. well, you, you were gonna say something about the uh um i oh, mean the context and the fucking man. so you know i can i try i think you guys we've brought up a lot of interesting stuff i mean i think what we can say about schizoid personality disorder is that we all agree um that it involves you know abstracting and not concretizing right um that involves okay. working memory deficits um, that it involves, 
uh, more than just like, you know, a lack of desire for social relationships, but a much more, I think, conflicted picture and intense, I think intense ambivalence is a term I would use to characterize schizoid phenomena. Ambivalence to things intense. that we don't give a shit about, yes. <laughs> well, that's, you know, that's, I think social relationships or close relationships and intimacy I think ah are, man, that's a whole different can of worms too. Because there uh, are that exists. That's yeah. what's so cool is that on this server, I see intimacy oh. increase. I see social yeah. relationships. I see socialization happen on the server. It's just the the systems or or the the machinations in which these things occur are completely foreign to what a neurotypical person would qualify as being socializing and in, in, in socialization well there's a debate even like you know one of the criteria for schizoid pd is like has few friends and it's actually like operationalized like less than two or something um and I'm, the question is like what about social media friends um you know well even then it's really difficult because even on the internet we're very alienated because we can find individuals that have similar interests, but it's hard to find other people that have this kind of experiential situation, this, this experience of life. And so there's a higher chance of locating people like this okay. on the internet. And, and the internet, in fact, is I think Eleanor, um, Dr. Greenberg had mentioned, is like the age of the schizoid right now. Uh, the age I, of the I, schizoid. I, I, I've tweeted that. Yeah, yeah, because the age she, of COVID, the schizoid, yeah, the schizoid age, and and what's yeah. funny is that she she often Antonia. refers to she, she often refers to the seventies being the the BPD age, the, the age where BPD was like you, because every, everything was love and, and, and this it, is definitely it, the schizoid age. Yeah, this is the schizoid ever, age, and it's, that it, I think it, the age of anhedonia. If I were to write a book, that would be the title. Well, I mean, to be technical about it, like we're exposed to so much broader abstract information about there's so many vague potentials of people doing stuff in different places and then everybody has an opinion about all those things without knowing anything about it right? oh God, <laughs> right? so yes. the internet is making us more schizoid every day right <laughs> yeah um but, no i i just think there's like a general like curiosity about schizoid that people share because they see themselves in it and some people are more afraid of acknowledging that than others um, and I think some people don't and are not schizoid. Well, they become so afraid of it that they reject people like that. So. Yeah. Um, and I think people also, there are other people who are not schizoid. Um, I think often interpret schizoid behavior, you know, as like, you know, a personal attack maybe. Yeah, yeah. As, oh yeah. Like you don't, value, status, you don't care about yeah, it. Or yeah, yeah, just yeah, like, yeah. you know, the person's yeah. not giving me what I need or yeah, something. Exactly. Like there, that. There's, is there's one thing that schizoids don't give a shit about? It's decorum 90% of the time. Oh, <laughs> schizoid minimalism, right? No furniture. Uh, <laughs> why do I, bed. why do I need a frame on my bed? The mattress yeah. works just fine. Why do I need a dresser? I can just put my clothes in a cor cardboard. In the I used to keep all my clothes in a cardboard box because yeah. I didn't understand the point of a dresser. Why fold my clothes? Why do I care about wrinkles? Wrinkles don't yeah, matter. I, I can imagine someone being a hoarder with schizoid well that, that that would be a different that would be a different mechanism That'd be yeah like yeah it wouldn't be yeah. because they're hoarding to me, because the, of the quality the, of the items they'd be hoarding yeah. because they don't care not, enough you know, to, to clean. not like minimalism it's like <laughs> not even know, hoarding. i'm organizing the books on my bookshelf frequently to get this height and colors you know yeah in the correct order and that is a very schizoid thing i think i like to organize these books because these books are books that represent my ideas and connection to specific things and structures about the human mind and human experience. And so well, thus I like to I be organizing books. No, no, no. But, 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 and so thus by organizing them, I'm somehow and, and touching them, I'm somehow connecting myself to the information inside those oh, books. Yeah. And, I, and, and, and I love and, it. I love it. No. Yeah. It, 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 and so thus, uh, you know, giving them meaning and power and, and yeah. associated to my own oh, existence. Books, and blah, blah, yeah. blah. Like, okay. If you're, if you're having all those thoughts, then maybe. <laughs> I don't think I could have articulated that. I don't no, think but, anyone could have articulated. No, but, but I was saying, that if was you're a having a beautiful all... description. No, but if you're having, okay, but that wasn't even that beautiful. didn't require any effort. That's just how I think. That's what's funny. I have those kinds great. of thoughts constantly, and so if if uh, if you're having those thoughts while doing it, then maybe you might be right. 
if that's what you're experiencing while doing if that if, if symbolically I, I mean, represents yeah. something i i think uh, the action itself that would be I, the emphasis I, i'm mind. surprised that it's not that for some people you know I mean. I, well yeah well i mean an autistic version would be um you know focusing in if you're organizing colors or something it's like well i'm gonna yeah, organize the them. yeah, yeah the, the, the topics second. of the book really yeah. secondary all the yeah. books happen to be like about schizoid personality disorder. yeah Show you my book collection. No, you show us. Show us. Fuck it. Okay. Let's get it in. We're gonna. This, this is staying in. This is staying this in. Your book collection. In. This yeah. staying in. What do we got here? We got some. Oh, well, what is it? Well, zoom in. We can't see you. What, what you got? Oh, are you? A, are you a bibliophile? I. I think you know not. Like I, rare I, books. Self admission. Yeah. Rare. Yeah. Rare yeah. antique antiquarian psychiatry and psychology books. Um. Nerd. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I have um the first through fourth edition of David Wexler's The Measurement of Adult Intelligence, but no second edition. Um, I think I'm the only person in the face of the world who uh would be thought it would be a good idea to try to get every edition of that. Hey, why not? Um I don't read books because the information doesn't flow fast enough. I like audiobooks because i can turn them up to 2x speed or 3x really? speed yeah 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 that's i i enjoy books i like I listen, sitting yeah. there and i, I like audio and... i like audiobooks at a normal yeah. speed but you know about i like audiobooks about politics because i'm addicted to it if you've ever seen my twitter but um, <laughs> oh god I have. we have <laughs> oh, yes, yes, we have. yes we have. I, I, god knows how many people can say that but um, um uh, you know. but uh i i wanted to um so uh, Oh, yeah, I just feel like we, you know, it's we're good. We're not going to get to do justice to defining schizoid personality disorder, and maybe that's okay. But oh, yeah, that's part of the fun. You know, my view is that you know it does it has parts of schizoid avoidance, schizotypal, like John Livesley said in 1985, and that um, you know schizoid phenomena or sort of uh, the continuum of detachment to um i guess being emotionally moved by things um, oh we're, we're definitely emotionally moved by things yeah that's that's a, that's the that part that not, pisses no me off honestly that, that is, like my point yeah, is yeah. that it's a continuum that's the part that pisses me off all the time is hearing people say that uh people that are schizoid pd uh can't have any kind of emotional connection to anything well and what do you expect if the dsm defines it like you know yeah because it's a, like, well, that's just because they're, they're, that's just because they're not paying yeah. attention oh that, well, that, that's that's true um that's actually that's a good point um because there's dissociation and there's mm -hmm. certain schizoids who are disassociated and there's certain who aren't right so there's there's or, or ones with alexithymia right. too. I, 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 that's for me that's sort of the I, same yeah. Thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah 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 you guys are great knowing these constructs yeah. so maybe so, you'll appreciate the you know what it took for me to select like seven uh, traits that are theoretically relevant to distinguishing schizoid and avoidant. Oh, I'd like to hear those. So that's what my dissertation was. The traits were as follows, internalized shame as measured by the internalized shame scale. Um, rejection sensitivity is measured by the rejection sensitivity questionnaire. Social anhedonia is measured by the revised social anhedonia scale which was actually originally a part of a broader measure of schizotypy or you know, schizophrenia spectrum personality disorder, but later became a, a much more narrow scale. Um, uh, attachment style, um, specifically uh, avoidant uh, versus anxious attachment. Um, so I think attachment theory you know, is relevant to, to disentangling schizoid and avoidant PDs. Um, because there's, you know, two types of like detached attachment styles, right? One type is called dismissing avoidant attachment. And the other is anxious avoidant attachment. It doesn't take, you know, a great genius to map these onto the constructs of avoidant and schizoid personality disorder, which they map quite nicely. Um, and what I found was that indeed, uh, Schizo people who said they had a lot of schizoid traits also said that they had a lot of traits of um, avoidant attachment, whereas people with a lot of avoidant personality disorder traits said that they had a lot of both avoidant and uh, anxious attachment. Um, so attachment anxiety versus attachment avoidance is also, I think, an important variable. Uh, 
what the need to belong was another trait that I used. Um, because the DSM is basically saying people with schizoid PD don't have a need to belong. So it seems like an obvious Wrong. one. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, right. Uh, which they uh, do um, and do not. Um, but people with avoidant may have a stronger you know, need to belong and people with schizoid. Um, yeah, what, what's interesting too is that that need to belong or that description of not needing to belong often is a construct within a lot of schizoids that they use in order to uh, deal and cope with the alienation of not being able to connect to anyone. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and so I think defense, oh, I know that one. defense mechanisms, you know, I don't, uh, you know, I want to look more closely at the data to see if I can sort of tease out specific defense mechanisms, but I can just sort of say that, um, you know, what I found, like it or not, uh, was that avoidant people um, or people who endorsed, you know, traits of avoiding personality disorder use more adaptive and maladaptive defensive styles, whereas people who had endorsed more schizoid PD only endorsed more maladaptive defensive styles. Um, but, you know, I, don't, I had a hard time sort of, uh, you know, fitting that into a, you know, a theoretically coherent interpretation other than, in some general way, the DSM sort of paints avoidant PD as less severe than schizoid PD um, because avoidant is in, you know, axis uh, cluster C, which is like anxiety. Or isn't, isn't that you know. absurd on its face, though? Because like, yeah, no joke. The, the stronger the avoidant trait gets versus how strong the schizoid trait gets, like either could be more or less severe than the other. Yeah. yeah. And either yeah. could make you more or less functioning than the other for varying degrees because yeah. it's totally oh, it's just the fear and terror and depression and all the negative symptoms that make you less functional generally, along with high stress, low low working memory, and everything else. I mean, it doesn't really terror is the key word. Terror, yes, the terror the of existence and life. Um, <laughs> the terror of being. I mean, this is sort of psychoanalytic, right? Like, You're the, yeah, just that yeah. sentence. The terror of being. There, there the it is. You're, the done. Of being. you're done. You're, you're done. done. You're you're done. Being you got, you got personality disorder. Yeah, the terror yeah. of being, yeah. Being but as such. Yeah. Someone, there's a guy named Marvin Hervich who talks about annihilation anxiety, which strikes me as, you know, in the realm of schizoid phenomena, um, or at least, you know, being. It's, ca- it's interesting because there is a lot of annihilation anxiety, and then there's people that almost describe annihilation euphoria. Yeah. Which well, is like you, you can interpret this through Kierkegaard in the sense that like there's the fear of annihilating the whole for its parts, right? The fear mm-hmm. of being sucked out of the perspective of so much possibility into one and being limited. There's a sense of being limited. Yeah, that's the fear. Yeah. I would say that's similar to the fear of being consumed by another person, losing yeah. the self. The losing and of autonomy. Fundament- is very the fundamentally important. core schizoid feature is that it's you know fear of you know, being eaten by the other person, basically. Yeah. I, I just feel like that's such a weird way of saying it, though, right? When it's like, when I when I see Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard says, just choose, right? Like there's infinite potential. And the schizoid goes, no, I don't want to just choose. I want to stay in infinite potential. Thank you very much. Right? <laughs> right. Because, you know, I think, you know, shoot, and that anxiety about choosing, I think, is a schizoid feature. Yeah. And interestingly, it's also a feature of, you know, I would say it's opposite, which is like dependent personality disorder, but they do share, I think, some interesting dynamics that I, I need to kind of think about more to elaborate yeah, yeah, on. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, the dependent personality is interesting because if you fit it into the whole in-group, out-group, externalization, internalization thing, you that's something where you've got internalized incompetence. Or externalizing exter- competence. Externalized competence and in-group. Internalizing but it's ex- But it's, it's extreme, right? It's like very extreme. Yeah. yeah, but, it, you know, like, you know, another thing to note is that um, personality disorders are not always so maladaptive, you know, like a lot of schizoid personality disorder is going to allow someone to win a Nobel Prize, you know, it's going to... Um, that they won't care about. Or they may not, but... Yeah, you know. they, yeah. <laughs> they want to get back to whatever it is they are doing. <laughs> Right. Um, <laughs> but it, it could lead to somebody, you, you know, it could lead to Kant writing, you know, whatever. Some oh, it was, oh, definitely Kant. Kant and Kierkegaard and Schopenhauer. And Kant, Jung Kant was and, literally the one yeah. who, who um, 
reformulated Hipp Hippocrates, you know, theory of the four humors of phlegm as a personality, you know, well, well, construct. Kant's whole moral philosophy is the most top down moral philosophy that's ever been invented. It's like everything that we should do should be what everyone would do if the world was the best thing that it could be I if everyone it. did it so it's like dumb. it's the exact opposite of like autistic morality which is in this specific situation we do this because of this effect and this effect that's autistic morality I thought, yes i thought that's just being like a mature adult Wait, no no tell, tell uh, autistic morality would be um uh, uh jesus um come on Verb. give me give me the guy your uh, favorite guy uh, uh john just, stuart mill no your favorite guy what oh wait Wittgenstein? Yes. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Autistic oh, autistic morality is, is Wittgenstein. Obsessed about the use of particular words in particular contexts. Oh my god. With like a total hostility towards any affect or any <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's unnecessary. It's not yeah. needed. It's, it's not precise. It's, it's not, not precise. precise. It's not right. precise. It produces nothing. <laughs> Hello, yeah. that's me. That's me. That's me. Hello. That's verb. Wittgenstein. My, my, uh, Wittgenstein. A little Wittgenstein. Yeah. yeah. Um so I think um, solitude is healthy. We all need it. Um, and schizoid people need it more. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, but like, I. Well, we don't always need it. I wish I wrote this <laughs> book that I'm about to push or got some profit from it because i hope people do buy it because i love it and as a biblio oh shill shill yeah have, we're, we're, I, we're hitting it's not my book end. but i have i yeah. went on a you know a sort of schizoid or adhd hyper focus yeah collecting spree of like i gotta get all the first edition hardcovers of this fucking book and so i have a, <laughs> several copies of anthony store's uh book called solitude um he's a psychologist and psychoanalyst who uh i obviously was somewhat schizoid um you know, had been divorced a few times, but wrote this amazing book on solitude that really, um, you know, highlights uh, the value of it, how it is healthy, how society doesn't value it. And um, I don't know, I just felt personally seen and heard by reading the book. Um, and, you know, I think that, he, you know, his adding it to the list, theories right? and ideas are, are valid as a psychologist reading it, you know. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I, that people might, I think, would be interested in, I guess, would be, uh, I mean, A, my dissertation, which I must say is a pretty impressive history of schizoid personality disorder. At what, the what is it called? Of any actual research, like I spend like well more than half the pages on the history. Uh, um, what is it called? So maybe we can. The door. dissertation, um, it is called. Or where can we find it? Um, I can make it a bit. I mean, you'd have to buy it on uh what is that publishing company only 149.99 like 50 i i have to buy it i'm not i wrote it so uh, all right well if you want to buy so it the, the, the it title is the title is assessing the differential diagnosis and construct validity of dsm4 slash dsm5 schizoid and avoidant personality disorders found in your local j store yeah i it's going to be a bestseller um mm -hmm. I'm gonna have but, to uh, pop out early because I got okay. stuff to attend to. But uh, okay, yeah, I'll yeah. finish up here, Burb. I appreciate All right, the your last time. thing, if anyone is left listening to this, which if you are, well, Burb, you can hop off. I'll you should call me All or right. something because uh, you know I don't. Yeah, tell them where's your website. So what's, my what's website, my website has the best URL because I hired a good company to help me figure that out, and it's psychologistsny.com. So it's you know just psychologist with an S plural ny all one word dot com yeah send that to me uh when you have the chance that way i could put it in the video description when i do sure. it and like and any I'll... links you want i can put them in the video description yeah no there's stuff that you know your fan your uh listeners might be listening interested in especially i i got obsessed with creating a self-report measure of schizoid personality disorder because there isn't one there is you know in the research literature on schizotypal pd it's called the schizotypal personality questionnaire you know, there's the rejection sensitivity questionnaire, but there's nothing that really assesses schizoid because nobody can really define it because it has all these components of different things. So I was like, fuck it, I'm going to make a questionnaire. So I went oh, yeah. to this website called the International International Personality Item Pool, which, uh, if you're listening, is really cool because what it is is a, some academic psychologists got access to, you know, the actual 
versions of a bunch of real personality tests, paraphrased each question on those personality tests, made it publicly available so that you can use those items that have, are basically just paraphrased versions of, you know, like literally the questions on other personality tests. And they've correlated their, you know, paraphrased versions with the actual versions and shown there's not that much difference. So you can actually, you know, make your own Myers-Briggs or your own, you know, MMPI or your own, you know, five-factor Neo personality test by using, you know, somebody else's rephrasing of the same question on that test. Um, so I picked... Oh, cool. Yeah, it is pretty cool. So that website has questions that measure like every trait imaginable. So I picked questions that measure traits, you know, from social anhedonia and, you know, basically based on my understanding of what schizoid PD is, which hopefully you've gotten some sense of from this podcast. No, absolutely. Uh, um, and we're and with so, so that I made a long test. It was like 50 questions. Every question was really, I put a lot of thought into it. I even, I don't know how you know, kosher this is, uh, but with a patient, you know, asked who was schizoid and identifies a schizoid, you know, what they thought of each question and kind of workshopped it, you know, you're not supposed to kind of like benefit yourself from it. No, session. no, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But, but, uh, but I thought, I thought they, they're already dying. Body. They're like salivating at the glands, uh, getting a hold of this thing. And we're, so fucking 8,000 people have taken this test. And okay. Where can they take it? My website or like, can you make another test? They email yeah. me literally every week and I, I just ignore it. Cause like, I don't, sometimes I don't like to open my email because, you know, that's all it is. I can obviously get annihilated. Um, So, Uh, uh, so where can, yeah, so it's on my website. Uh, Hopefully they've made it obvious, had a link to it, but I'll send you a link to the test. I also, they love tests. Yeah. We have a section on the server called the test lab now. Where oh, we yeah. just we have nothing but psych tests on there. <laughs> well, this is a new, this is a made up, this is a, honestly a brand new made up test. It has no you yeah. know valid psychometric studies done it, but it's you know created by someone who does know what they're talking about. And they thought you know I think my whole it is, channel is brand new made up bullshit. So I'm trying my best here. Don't worry. But I just want to tell people ahead of time if you do take the test, you know it's a little bit painstaking, but um, if you identify a schizoid and the test says, you know, the results, you know, do not suggest that you screen positive for probable schizoid PD. That just means that I was worried that people were going to get upset about being diagnosed with P- schizoid PD and sue me or something. So I made the test extremely hard to get, uh, you know, to score in a way that you would get a result that says you have probable schizoid PD or something. Oh, like yeah, that. That, that would make sense. I, I don't think a lot of the people maybe maybe we, uh, we'll, we'll take a look at the test. Or we'll, we'll start using it. I would <laughs> imagine love to for, feedback force on. people. Imagine force people to do it in order to get into our server <laughs> that, that would be awesome no that would be the that would be awesome but it would be good for the tests you no know. it would be good for the test but definitely if uh if i get a link on the server i guarantee you there's going to be at least 100 people on there that are going to want to jump on it. yeah and but i mean i would like you know the test is basically you know it's measuring one thing i'm saying like you know probability that you you know may be diagnosed with schizoid personality disorder you know upon a you know comprehensive interview um yeah. And, but I think that the test, you know, you could reasonably think about it in terms of it measuring different sub factors or sub factors of schizoid PD or different, you know, components of it. Yeah. Um, and that's sort of what we were talking about today is there are the different traits that comprise schizoid PD. And if people do take the test, you know, I would love uh, to hear anybody's ideas about what those dimensions of schizoid PD you know, they think the test does tap or doesn't tap. Well, if they send me any feedback, I can definitely relay it since you said your cool. email's flooded. The so. other thing, the other thing <laughs> I had this idea today, I don't know if anyone's into it, um, but, you know, I wanted to say a little bit about um, the diagnosis and assessment of schizoid PD um, and just about yeah. self-diagnosis in general, because obviously that's, you know, all the zeitgeist. Yeah, make right your now. statement. Um, which, you know, is, is fine. Uh, you know, I'm sure there are some people who would, you know, be very upset about it or something, but whatever. Um, my point, uh, is just that there are, um, there are so many different ways to diagnose any mental disorder. And a lot of it depends on the psychiatrist or psychologist or social worker that you happen to see. Um, and, uh, and what their theoretical orientation is. Um, So, you know, the the gold standard academic psychology sort of um, 
be, you know, you couldn't really criticize it uh, from any sort of uh, normy perspective um, would be the, uh, the SID P, which is the structured interview for personality disorders, um, which I have, you know, for schizoid PD, it's just a bunch of questions. Um, it's like a script, uh, literally, the assessment is me reading questions and then, you know, checking a box if you answered yes or no, and then either following up or not, depending on what this script tells me. And a lot of people have issues with that as a way to diagnose anything, but for whatever it's worth, that's what's used to diagnose personality disorders in research. And it would be considered the gold standard. And I'm happy to um, read those questions to anybody who's interested in whether or not they would qualify for, you know, formal DSM-5 TR, schizoid PD. Um, you know, it could be done in a group. That sounds, um, that sounds like a blast. We can. Yeah, we can I thought it would be cool. Um, no, anything like that. Hey, it, it, if it lends credibility to me trying to help people, I don't give a shit. Yeah, I'm, and I'm I just, if people, can, people, I'll be reading the questions. People can listen and just write, you know, like yeah. check or X, depending on whether they feel like, you know, the answer is yes or no. And then I can tell people. I, I, I guarantee well. you that if, uh, if uh, there would be people that would be interested in something like that, and uh, we can definitely figure something out. That okay. would be definitely a thing like that. I don't think I would have too much problem putting yeah. it out there and getting a few heads. Right. As long so as I, it, I that's one way to measure. Another is like through a bunch of self-report measures like I yeah. gave in my dissertation. Another is to combine them. And, or you might just see someone who's like, I got an intuition, you're schizoid. And then writes, and then you've got a diagnosis. So, you know, the quest for a formal diagnosis is certainly understandable, but I would just, you know, uh, take into account that the competence of different practitioners differs widely in connection to their knowledge of um, current diagnostic practices. Mm -hmm. Well, um, for me. well, that's it for you. You got it. Okay. So um, just real quick, thank you for all that. Uh, thank you for joining me. I'm going to show myself a little bit. So anybody listening to this uh, that hasn't watched my stuff before, if you got to the end, please think about joining my Patreon. Uh, you can become a garden hermit there, which basically allows you to go into specific parts of the server. Uh, it also lets you join, um, uh, uh, get early access to videos like this, uh, things like that. Um, and, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, if you if you want to contribute to this project, I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, you have your hand up. Go ahead. <laughs> If you know we're selling ourselves, I might as well. No, uh, that's why I was saying shill away, shill, shill, shill. Yeah. So yeah, I know I'm kind of like self-conscious about shilling anything. Yeah, um, I was too, but I just stopped giving a shit because nothing matters. No, but I do, I do, you know, practice psychotherapy and I do specialize in schizoid personality disorder. I do there use Zoom. I do have an office in Manhattan on the Upper West Side, um, but also virtual. And the other thing that I do that I think is relevant to our discussion today about working memory um, is, you know, neuropsych psychoeducational testing to diagnose um, ADHD learning disabilities, those two mainly. And I try not to diagnose autism because I feel like I'm not an expert at that. And I don't want to um, say yes or no, but I'm very confident in my ability to diagnose ADHD or a learning disability. And I think that those things are sort of schizoid related. And in that, you know, uh, one of the things that people with schizoid personality deal with um, often is, you know, problems with social interaction, not understanding what's happening. In other words, nonverbal learning disability um, and problems with working memory, um, which you see in ADHD. So it wouldn't, shock me if someone who thinks that they have schizoid also qualifies for one of these other diagnoses which give you all types of good shit um like double time on the sats or time and a half on the lsat or um your boss would think twice about firing you because you have a diagnosis protected by the americans with disabilities act um, but i do charge a lot for this testing but i would love to uh be available for you if that's what you want to do i'm pretty good at it that's if you're not broke, you can do it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but, but I have a fighting scout. I've, no, no. I'm, I'm truth be told, I have an assistant who will do it for like a lot less than me. And I'll, yeah, I'll yeah. take like the most side of the money. That, yeah. Um, but she'll do the testing. She's very sweet. And um, I know that it's very hard to get a formal diagnosis of 
you know, any of those. Oh, it's so. a bitch and a half. Um, I am more affordable than other people in New York City, but way more expensive than people outside of New York City. No, of course. You live in New York City. You have to charge an arm and a leg for everything, considering that anywhere you live in New York City costs an arm and a leg. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I totally understand the uh, what's the word? The problems. Yeah, that come with, it's yeah. been a pleasure. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad you joined me and uh, read Jonathan Heights, The Righteous Mind. Yes. Yeah, I will. I and like I, I hope that you'd be interested in, uh, read in Solitude Com- by Anthony Storm. I will. I already said I, I, I got to check that out. Um, but I hope uh, you'd be interested in the future, any other conversations, uh, if you ever, or, or any other kind of collaboration, like the ones. I would love it. This was very comfortable for me. Honestly. Oh, good. I, I like to, I like it for it to be that way. I, I, like I said, decorum is horseshit. So um, in any case, uh, thank you. And uh, right. thank you to anybody watching. Uh, have an awesome uh, day. And as usual, uh, when day is dark, always remember happy day. <laughs>